And good evening. We have been following Hurricane Ian's deadly course for days now. And as you can see right here, it is not done yet. This is the latest radar. It's just a massive blob of wind and moisture still impacting several states. So let's take a look at some of the stats right now. The wind's right now at 70 miles per hour, so just below a hurricane. And it's moving north at 15 miles per hour, pushing further and further inland. Now, Ian continuing its march north after making landfall in South Carolina earlier today as a category one storm and you can just see how strong this wind is as we get closer to this image here the eye wall came on shore this was the scene just south of myrtle beach in litchfield beach south carolina late this afternoon and you can just see how strong those wind gusts were and on Polly's island it looked even worse there the fierce waves there causing a pier to partially collapse chunks of that iconic landmark floating out to sea but of course we cannot forget what is happening still in florida bearing the brunt of ian's wrath in Lee County, homes still inundated more than 48 hours after the storm made landfall as a Category 4 hurricane. And just as we saw there in Florida, the storm surge devastating the coast in South Carolina. This TikTok showing the moment the waves came crashing into one family's backyard in Myrtle Beach. In the center of town, several people trapped on the second story of a motel there. The fire department, though, able to pluck them out to safety with a crane. WMBF reporter Corrine McGrath joins us now live from North Myrtle Beach. And Corrine, as we look over your shoulder there, we can see a piece of that pier is actually gone. Good evening, Tom. We are still getting a lot of wind, but the majority of the storm is past us now, leaving behind a lot of damage to have to clean up. Like you said, the pier behind me has been destroyed about 30 or 40 feet. And as you walk down the beach, we're seeing remnants of the pier both in the water and washed up on the sand. There's also was a shrimp boat that washed up on Myrtle Beach about 20 miles south of where I am right now. Now, they said that they had docked the boat last night. They aren't sure if anybody was on that boat, but that has washed up and is currently leaking oil is what they're concerned about into the ocean. Kareem, you know, we know Myrtle Beach so well because of that iconic coastline. It's, it's the biggest, most beautiful beach, or one of the most beautiful beaches, I should say, in South Carolina, part of the Grand Strand there. But it seems to have gotten the brunt of Ian today. Just how bad was that storm surge? Can, can you put it into words? You know, around 2 p.m., I think, is when it hit us the worst, and, and it was flooding parking lots. There were shingles coming off of homes. Very scary just to be outside and hard to even stand up on your own two feet. So there's definitely going to be a couple of months of having to rebuild after this. Definitely a scary day, and I think it was is a, a little worse than what people were actually expecting. Um, so definitely going. A lot of people that we talked to today made the drive just in the last hour. They're a little inland and have a condo here. They made the drive to see. How how their condos were doing there there's definitely a lot of uh, uh, shutters off of homes and, and, and roofing so it's going to be a, a big cleanup after this one all right kareen mcgrath from north myrtle beach tonight from our affiliate there wmbf we thank you so much you and your team stay safe tonight i do want to turn now to our meteorologist bill karens who has guided us over the last few days bill we were talking earlier today as ian made its second landfall just south there of myrtle beach yes. and that whole area north of Charleston really felt the brunt of the storm. Yeah, right around Georgetown northwards. And uh, there's no such thing as a hurricane landfall. You know, that's easy. I mean, even though it wasn't a Cat 4, there still left its mark. So now we're worried about the rain moving through. We do have numerous areas that are under flash flood watches. There's about 15 million people that are under flash flood watches. And we now have some flash flood warnings that include some big population centers, Raleigh, Fayetteville, Florence, South Carolina, the Norfolk, Virginia Beach areas. And this will be the life-threatening portion of the storm through the remainder of the night. The wind 
winds have really died off significantly. Hopefully we won't get too many power outages. There's enough out there already between, you know, the Carolinas, Virginia and Florida and also Puerto Rico, by the way, it still has a quarter million people without power. And so two to three to four inches of rain still likely West Virginia and southern New England looks like to get the heavy rain. And Tom, as I mentioned, these winds have now come down 30 to 40 miles per hour. So I don't expect a lot more in the way of wind destruction. All right, Bill Cairns for us. Bill, we appreciate that. Hurricane Ian's path of destruction cut off an entire island from Florida's mainland, leaving many stranded and complicating rescue and recovery efforts. Tonight, our Morgan Chesky takes a look at the hard-hit Sanibel Island from the sky. Tonight on Sanibel Island, paradise lost. The gorgeous beach getaway torn to shreds by Ian's wind and storm surge, prompting a massive rescue effort. The damage is catastrophic and it is biblical. We know that people have been through a traumatic experience here uh, and they just want to uh, get off the island and be safe. The barrier island, which is home to more than 6,000 year-round residents, is now only accessible by boat or helicopter after the three-mile causeway that connects to the mainland was left battered and broken. To view the damage up close, it's almost frightening to see just how easily Ian shoot through tons of concrete and steel. But to view the damage from above, heartbreaking when you realize this is the only way an entire community can reach the place they call home. We join Lee County Sheriff Carmine Marcino on an aerial survey of Sanibel to see the devastation firsthand. Is there a goal time to have everyone accounted for? Howard Simon and his wife Beth retired to Sanibel three years ago. They decided to evacuate at the last minute, but still felt the full wrath of Ian's fury. We rode out ferocious winds for about a day, um, but we were safe. With cell service and power knocked out on the entire island, he has no way to know how his house or his friends have fared. We don't know when we can ever get back there to see how much damage we have put Everything we have, love and care and whatever tre small treasure we have into this home. Some who once called it home, now unsure if they'll ever come back. We know, I mean, with the damage out there, we are not going to be the first in line to get our house fixed. You're leaving. For now, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, Morgan Chesky joins us now from Fort Myers Beach, Florida. So, Morgan, going back to Sanibel Island, you, you were able to get there, but are there still people on the island? Yeah, Tom, hard to believe, but there are. I spoke to that woman who was rescued off the island today after packing up whatever she could and getting on one of those rescue boats. There are people there right now, Tom, choosing to stay there despite having no electricity, no running water, uh, and really no place to call home for the most part. Uh, we know that almost every building there has suffered some significant damage. The sheriff here in Lee County says that they're going to try to take water and other supplies by helicopter or by boat as much as they can. Uh, but as it stands right now, the long-term future for Sanibel Island, this piece of paradise on the Florida coast, is highly uncertain. Tom? Morgan Chesky with a very eye-opening report tonight from Sanibel and Fort Myers. Morgan, we appreciate it. And tonight, also happening in Florida, one of the most important rescue missions now underway, the urgent evacuation of hundreds of patients from hospitals across the state. Sam Brock is in Fort Myers with that story. Beyond the physical devastation of Ian, there's another less visible emergency evolving. Hundreds of patients now being rushed out of hospitals with no working water and in some cases no power, according to the governor, including 600 in the Lee Health System, which has nearly 70 newborns in the NICU. Is this the hardest part of transferring? Is it the, is it the NICU children? I think it's the most sensitive and requires the most delicate work. The challenge is the scale and the number of patients that have to be moved. On the other end of that move, hospitals in areas less hard hit ready to help. Like Joe DiMaggio Children's Hospital in Broward County, which is now caring for eight of those babies and expects a dozen more. The infants usually arriving by medevac with doctors from both hospitals in constant communication. These are very fragile patients, so it is very delicate. It requires the utmost expertise of nursing, respiratory care, our physicians. Ten hospitals statewide are in the process of evacuating some or all of their patients, creating chaos and uncertainty for loved ones like Melinda Holloway, whose father recently suffered a stroke. I'm a little emotional. Uh, I try to hold it together. Usually I'm not 
that emotional, but uh, it's my dad. <laughs> I guess it, everybody feels that way about their dad, but you know, um, I just want to get out there and help. Yet in the madness to move so many people so quickly, there's the steady hand of the healthcare workers, many of whom have lost homes or haven't seen loved ones, but continue regardless. We've had people here working three, four days straight, again, not knowing what the status of their, their houses are, their families. And so to have that and have to still come in and do the kind of work that these people do is truly heroic. And, and I, you know, I couldn't be more proud. And Tom, as this incredible staff continues to work so hard in trying conditions, you might be asking yourself, how long does this take and how long will it go on for? All of these patients largely are going by themselves or with a couple others in an ambulance or a chopper, which is to say you're talking about hundreds of trips. It's going to be accomplished in three to five days. But the CEO of Lee Health told me it is unclear at this point how long this situation might persist, when they might be able to repair the water main breaks so that these hospitals are functional again. Right now, it's a wait and see sort of approach. That's the very latest here in Lee County. Tom, let me send it back to you. Charges announced by the Justice Department this week alleging an American Army doctor tried to hand over state secrets. The accused ended up dealing with undercover FBI agents instead of foreign spies. Our justice correspondent Ken Delanian has more. Federal prosecutors are accusing this couple of handing over sensitive and potentially damaging information to help Russia in its war with Ukraine. Are you loyal to Russia, sir? They now face years in prison. An indictment unsealed this week says Dr. Anna Gabrielian, an anesthesiologist, offered to provide confidential medical records about U.S. soldiers. It says she first reached out to the Russian embassy, offering her assistance. After she reached out to the Russian embassy, what it appears to me is that the FBI learned of it and then reached out to her in an undercover capacity, acting on behalf as the Russian you know, embassy or Russian intelligence service, and created the impression in her mind that she was dealing with the Russians when in fact she was dealing with the FBI in an undercover capacity. The indictment says Gabriellian, who worked at the prestigious Johns Hopkins Medical Center, met the undercover FBI agent at least three times in hotel rooms. It says she brought along her spouse, Major Jamie Lee Henry, an army doctor at Fort Bragg, home of some of America's most elite soldiers. Prosecutors say Gabriellian told the agent that she wanted to help because of her patriotism towards Russia, even if it meant being fired or going to jail. The indictment says Gabriellian provided the undercover agent records of an intelligence officer's spouse and highlighted a medical issue the Russians could exploit. It says Henry tried to join the Russian army and quoted him as saying that the United States is using Ukrainians as a proxy for their own hatred towards Russia. Henry is accused of providing records on five people who were patients at Fort Bragg. The medical records that these defendants were allegedly offering the Russians were actually very valuable. Well, any intelligence service looks for vulnerabilities in individuals that it could target for recruitment. Uh, if an individual has a medical ailment, you know, something that perhaps is incredibly uh, costly in, in terms of needing money. That's a vulnerability. Henry announced a transition to female in 2015, but referred to themselves as male in interactions with the FBI agent. The couple has three young children, have yet to make a plea, and are now free on bail. Henry's lawyer declined to comment, and Gabriellians could not be reached. And that's not the only case grabbing headlines. A former NSA intelligence officer was charged this week with attempting to sell secrets in exchange for cryptocurrency. The officer allegedly sent excerpts of three classified documents to an undercover FBI agent he believed to be working for a foreign government. Tom? All right, Ken Delaney for us tonight. Ken, we appreciate it. Still ahead tonight here on Top Story, Ukraine putting the pressure on NATO. President Zelensky urging world leaders to let them into the alliance as Putin annexes more of his country. But how will NATO respond? Plus, the new ALS drug approved by the FDA much of the funding coming from that viral ice bucket challenge you may remember. So why are some worried about the medication's effectiveness? And the Zell tech scam, have you heard about this one? A growing warning tonight for users of the popular money sending app, the red flags you should be looking out for. Top story just getting started on this Friday. We're back with a growing scam tonight. Quick payment services like Zelle have been paying your bills or your friends very convenient, but they can also make scammers' jobs easier as well. Here's NBC's Stephen Romo with how you can protect yourself. 
For 45-year-old Marcus Miles, it started with a text from an unknown number. Did you authorize a $500 payment through Zelle? Yes or no. Then a phone call came from a man claiming to work for Capital One. In just minutes, a scammer convinced Miles he was being hacked and had to hand over his account information. As soon as we hung up, I got a notification that said a Zelle transfer for all of the money in my bank account had been successful. An entire checking account stolen just like that. What was going through your head once you realized that guy was a scammer? I might as well have just taken my money outside and given you know, on the street and given it to the first person that I saw. It would feel a lot less intrusive for sure. Miles is one of countless victims of a new generation of scams that use mobile banking apps and quick pay services like Zelle, which can transfer money in the blink of an eye. His bank agreed to credit his account. But that's not always the case. There are real victims at the end of this, and sometimes they lose absolutely everything. Cybercrime expert Tyler Cohen Wood says awareness is the first step. What do people need to know now? People need to know that these attacks have gotten more and more aggressive. These types of attacks often rely on your good nature, fear, and urgency. In a hearing last week, Senator Elizabeth Warren grilled the banks, which owns them. When customers say, I've got a problem, you say, I'm only going to reimburse a narrow slice of those who hold up their hands and say that they have been defrauded on the system. Zell now including this warning when logging into the app. In a statement to NBC News, Zell's parent company, Early Warning Services, owned by a number of big banks, did not address reimbursements, but did emphasize the importance of consumer education and advise users to only send money to people they know and trust. All right, Stephen Romo joins us now uh, in studio. So, Stephen, two questions for you. Are people getting reimbursed, and what are the big red flags we should look out for? Yeah, sometimes they are getting reimbursed, but it really depends on the type of scam and the institution that they're working with. As far as red flags, it'd be great if there was a telltale sign, but mostly we're told by experts to watch for high-pressure situations. And if the person on the other end of the text or on the phone is using fear, that should be a red flag for you. All right, that's a good tip. Stephen, we appreciate it. Thank you. We want to turn now to a new ALS treatment, getting approval from the FDA. It's development thanks in part to, you may remember this, the Ice Bucket Challenge, but its approval is being met with some controversy. NBC's Nyella Charles explains why. In 2014, the masses came together in a viral sensation. From Oprah and Justin Bieber to everyday people. All enduring buckets of ice-cold water enthusiastically in hopes of bringing awareness to ALS. The, ALS which is the initiative spurred millions of dollars in donations to help fight the debilitating disease. And now a tangible result. The FDA approving Relivrio, a new ALS drug by Amelix Pharmaceuticals making it one of just a handful available to fight the devastating illness that slowly takes away muscle function. If a community comes together, they pool their resources, we together can do great things and we can solve some of the hardest problems that we have. The ALS Association president telling NBC News the money from the Ice Bucket Challenge partially funding the drug's development. <laughs> Six months after Sunny Browse did the challenge, she was diagnosed with ALS at just 27 years old. Sitting in the room, being told that my entire life was going to be different than anything I had ever imagined. Seven years later, she's in a motorized chair. I thought I would be married, chasing babies, working on my career, and now I'm storing up energy to be able to you know, go to a, a nighttime event. There's no cure for ALS, making every second count. I try to stay as self-aware as possible to make the most out of whatever exertion I am able to. Yeah. Relivrio's approval comes after the FDA advisory committee narrowly voted against recommending it in March, questioning its effectiveness following its phase two trial. But now in what experts describe as an unusual move, the FDA approving it after Amelix submitted more analysis of its data. The FDA saying in its memorandum there were no differences in fatal or serious adverse events between the drug and placebo. But the turnaround raising questions. What makes the approval of this drug so unique? The controversy is that it, we hope that this drug works. We have some promising evidence, but we are not sure that this drug 
works. The FDA acknowledging in its memorandum the study's limitations and uncertainty about effectiveness, but saying the life-threatening nature of ALS and the substantial unmet need influenced its decision. If FDA's job is to force companies to prove that their products work, that standard is getting lower and lower and lower, and companies are unlikely to produce more evidence than FDA requires. But for Sunny, any news is good news in the fight against ALS. I'm so passionate about this approval and any others that are in the pipeline because now it's bigger than me. All right, Nyella joins us now live from Los Angeles. You know, Nyella, you, you feel so much for, for all of those people with ALS. But I guess the question tonight is, if the medical community is not sure if the drug works, will doctors encourage patients to take it? That's a huge question, Tom, and really only time will tell here. The FDA is trying to quell any concerns, telling us that it followed the science and that substantial evidence of effectiveness was provided in the approval. The LS Association supports the approval as well, so that's also a strong signal to doctors. However, the scientific process isn't finished yet. There's an ongoing phase three trial right now, and depending on those results, Amalex can voluntarily take the drugs off the market or the FDA could withdraw its approval, and the latter could take years. Tom? Yeah, we all hope the data just gets more and more encouraging. All right, Nyella, we thank you for that. When we come back, the blackout protest in Cuba, much of the island still without power more than three days after Hurricane Ian hit the western part of the island. The new image is coming in tonight. All right, we're back now with Top Stories News Feed. We begin with the shocking murder of an FDNY paramedic here in New York City. Lieutenant Allison Russo Elling brutally stabbed and killed in an unprovoked attack late Thursday. The assailant, with no known connection to this victim, arrested after barricading himself in a nearby apartment. Police say he has a history of mental illness. Russo Elling, a first responder who rushed to the World Trade Center on 9-11, was 61 years old. And the newest Supreme Court justice formally sworn in and welcomed by her colleagues today. Justice Kentanji Brown Jackson taking part in a traditional investiture ceremony and making her first appearance on the bench. The proceedings attended by President Biden and Vice President Harris. Jackson, of course, the first black woman to serve on the high court. The court's new term begins this Monday. All right, we want to turn now back to that major story we've been following tonight, Hurricane Ian. In Florida, the destruction is vast. We saw that earlier. But even in areas more than 100 miles from where the monster storm first made landfall. In the center of the state, entire neighborhoods remain underwater as people uncover what's left of their devastated communities. Here's NBC's Jesse Kirsch from Orlando tonight. Tonight, Ian's trail of destruction in Florida stretches from coast to coast. In Orlando, emergency evacuations continued into this morning. People were carried to boats outside of their nursing home and shuttled to safety, with many still in their wheelchairs. Is there anybody in there? And video just released showing sheriff's deputies yesterday using rope to form a human chain. Oh. Oh. And rescue a woman whose car was swept away by strong currents. Okay. Today, more than 100 miles from landfall, entire Florida communities remain underwater. Residents are navigating some streets by boat. And in this Orlando neighborhood, even though it hasn't rained all day, the streets are still submerged as residents return to see what's left. It was like the entire world just came crashing down on us. We worked really hard to have it, and now it's, it's gone. Angela, Sarah, and Meredith are grateful to be alive. That's their home. Do you think there's any chance you could still live there? No. no. And when this water's gone, it's going to take so much land with it, it's not going to be safe to even occupy that space anymore. And right now, it's not even safe to get a closer look. Literally right now, there's an alligator, there's alligator. right in front of us, yeah. so yeah. you really have to keep waiting to get in there. Yeah. A reminder of what people can't see in the waters. In addition to downed power lines after hurricanes or tropical storms, wildlife like alligators and snakes can wash into communities. Communities already dealing with so much. All right, Jesse Kirsch joins us now from Orlando. Jesse, that wildlife you mentioned there at the end of your story is not something to take lightly. 
No, absolutely not, Tom. We repeatedly saw an alligator making its way through this neighborhood throughout the day. And we also saw at one point a pair of people walking through these floodwaters. And we shouted over to them to let them know that we had seen an alligator. And thankfully, they turned around and hopefully they are OK tonight. And as you mentioned, this is not something to take lightly. Just last year, in the aftermath of Hurricane Ida, officials in Louisiana confirmed that they found the remains of a man in the stomach of an alligator after he reportedly was attacked by a gator in the aftermath of that storm and then went missing. So as just one more reminder that you don't know what is in those waters, whether they be uh, living creatures or objects, including, of course, down power lines, you should stay out of the floodwaters and check on damage to property later. Of course, people are losing so much in these situations, but it is not worth risking your life to check on what you might be able to salvage later. As long as you and your loved ones are alive, of course, Tom, that is what is most important, Tom. Jesse Kirsch from Orlando tonight for us. Jesse, we appreciate it. Time now for Top Stories Global Watch. And fears of a coup in Burkina Faso for a second time this year. Gunshots ringing out in the nation's capital. The state television station going dark. Some residents now believe the country's current president is under threat of a military takeover. He ousted the country's democratically elected leader back in January. And a suicide bombing rocking an education center in Afghanistan. New video shows classrooms in Kabul. Look at that. Decimated by the explosion, debris left hanging from the ceiling. Students were taking exams inside when the blast went off. At least 19 people killed, dozens more injured. So far, no one has claimed responsibility. And in Cuba, protests erupting amid rolling blackouts caused by Hurricane Ian. New video showing Cubans banging pots and pans, setting fires in the streets of Havana. Several neighborhoods across the nation's capital have joined the protests. Power still out for a majority of the country's 11 million residents three days after the storm made landfall on the western part of the island. And we head to the war in Ukraine now. Putin illegally annexing four regions of the country he invaded and holding a celebratory concert in Moscow's Red Square. This is Ukraine's president is now putting pressure on NATO as his country officially applies for accelerated membership. Erin McLaughlin in Kyiv tonight for us. Tonight, Russian President Vladimir Putin proclaiming victory will be ours while hosting a celebratory concert in Moscow's Red Square after formally announcing the illegal annexation of 15 percent of Ukraine, joining hands with the leaders of four Russian-occupied regions, chanting Russia, <laughs> signaling a new escalation of this war in a fiery speech claiming the citizens of those regions made their choice in what the West has called a sham referendum. Putin warning he'll do everything possible to defend the Ukrainian territory as his own, including a veiled threat that might include nuclear weapons, alleging the U.S. and its allies blew up Russia's lucrative Nord Stream gas pipeline, an accusation the U.S. is calling absurd. When things calm down, we're going to be sending divers down to find out exactly what happened. Meanwhile, Ukraine's President Zelensky not backing down and formally submitting Ukraine's NATO application, a Kremlin red line, though for now it's highly unlikely NATO would approve Ukraine joining the alliance. Hours before Putin's annexation ceremony, more bloodshed. A series of rocket strikes on a humanitarian convoy taking aid into Russian-controlled Zaporizhia killing at least 30. Yet another senseless tragedy in an ever-escalating war that this Ukrainian soldier says they'll fight for as long as it takes. I have a son. He's 10 years old. You must stop in Russian here. You don't want to see your son go through this. Yeah. Meanwhile, tonight, Secretary of State Blinken says they've not seen anything to suggest Russia is contemplating the use of nuclear weapons. Tom. We in the world hope so. Okay, Aaron, thank you for that. Have a great weekend. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.